Hi, I'm Mark Belaish. I'm president of the Canadian Mu Virtual Music Expo. Thanks for coming today. Uh, great uh, crew here right now. Uh, I'm going to introduce Michael Williams, and he's going to introduce the, to the crew here, and I'm going to take a, a quick stage left, and I'll be back. And uh, if you have any questions for the crew, uh, just uh, uh, put it on to um, uh, put it on the event chat, and I'll, I'll make sure that uh, Michael sees it. So thanks very much for watching, and uh, go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Mark, and uh, good morning, all. Uh, Gordon, Sandy, how you doing? Good. Pretty good, considering, yeah. <laughs> how, uh, how are you guys getting through this pandemic time? Because it seems to be a pretty creative period for you. And this is your 40th anniversary. I'm sure there were a lot of things that you thought you'd be doing now, as opposed to doing this or sitting at home. Yeah, well, like a lot, lot of bands, um, we're kind of on hold right now, but because it was our 40th anniversary, we were going to be extra busy with festivals, bringing back the old band and and videos and that sort of thing. Obviously, that's not happening, but we're doing a second segment, uh, I think at 30 about actually dealing with the pandemic. So we won't talk about it too much, but we've been able to keep really creative and come up with some really ingenious things that I think we want to share with anybody who's listening in who might be in a band or whatever, because there are some things you can do that some people are doing other people who don't even know about you know like uh well, the one thing is being our 40th um we were going to do a video which we couldn't but we got around that and sort of tied together the 40th anniversary with the pandemic and the messages that we want to send out about that and our feelings and put it into a video that we pretty well did at home with iphones you know uh and we did that with a whole bunch of guests we got we got all our friends in the music and in the arts you know tv sports right right from Corey hart to jo curtis joseph to ed the sock you know and yourself <laughs> you know, to um, participate and do little things on their iphone and you can watch the video for that song um i think it's on the website for for the event mm -hmm. and i mean talk about this the title is just crazy i mean mm -hmm. yeah Andy, I mean, you yeah, it, explain yeah. That. yes it's called new day new world is the title track for the album and uh with everything, I mean, this, Gord wrote the song and we recorded the song well before this pandemic happened, but um, our producer, Peter uh, Sacco, um, came up with the idea one night sleeping that, you know, new day, new world, that's exactly what we have now, a brand new world that we don't really quite know how to move around yet in, and, and it's a brand new world that we all have to try and get ourselves back out there and keep balance, but safe, safe distancing, um, looking after each other, staying at home to when we can. Um, so it's kind of like the song was ahead of itself, but it, it, yeah. it's perfect. And we did another one. We did another one a month before that for a song called Landing Lights. Right. And again, I mean, it was written over a year ago and, or released. And um, the message in it, lyrically, it could be taken on a personal level, but also it's kind of about how we're all in the same boat right now and how Lenny might sort of guide you back home after everything, like mm -hmm. through storms and clouds and turbulence on a plane, wherever you kind of come back and land somehow. And we dedicated that to the uh, frontline workers and um, had a lot of cameos in there as well. And once again, we can't really re create new stuff right now. I'm not in the mood to really write or record new stuff, but take what you already have, you know, in our case, yeah. um, this album that came out geez, last year, and apply it to what we're going through right now or, or mm -hmm. get the most out of it by doing videos and live perform or performances on on the internet that sort of thing yeah now let's go back did you think this was going to actually last for 40 years the two of you when you started this 40 years ago <laughs> or did you any inkling that this was going to you know last this long let's go through yeah. some of the highlights of the spoons career so uh for people that don't know you be you began the spoons when and how did you meet? Uh, well, Gordon and I met in high school, uh, high school band. I played trumpet, he played sax, and the way the orchestra was set up, uh, I sat right beside him. And uh, on a band trip to Armprior, Ontario, to, uh, to perform for another high school, uh, I had my acoustic guitar with me, and Gord had his. And eventually, they got to the back of the bus, and Gord said, "Here, play these root notes," which was basically the four. Uh, lower strings on the acoustic guitar and that's how I started playing bass and he's like we need a, I have a band called Impulse at the time do you do you want to play bass and I went sure I'll go ask my dad yeah you were like <laughs> how old were you like 15 I think 15 yeah <laughs> you know, at the time 
<laughs> yeah, so we, we formed out of high school. And at the time, I was also in gymnastics, for me anyway. Mm -hmm. And I was also part of the big the team there going into competitions and music class was and gymnastics at the same time. And I looked at the Rolling Stones who were around 40 at that time and had been around for many years already. I went, I think musical lasts longer than gymnastics. Let's go for music. <laughs> yeah. And what was the, uh, when did you think that you could actually record this, this combination of the two of you, when did you start to record it? And well, we, well, we, well you know what we, we got a record deal really fast. And this is the days when you had to still send out the cassette tape. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a, 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 what do you call it? A bio photo. And, uh -huh. and a, a type that this is before electronic packages or bio, right? Yeah. And you had to deliver it by hand usually. You want to make sure the mail didn't screw it up. So I got it on the desk. And people have asked that. Is that wasn't that really difficult to deal that way? Because it was so archaic, right? But I'm, we, thought, we talked about this. And I think it was easier or um, your chances in the lottery were better because now there's you know it's the quick online way to market yourself or get mm -hmm. yourself in front of a label or something but you're competing with so many millions more right back then maybe they got i don't know 10 or 15 packages on their day from local bands you know to look through their demo tapes now they're getting an onslaught of stuff you know so maybe the day of cassette tapes is going to come back, you know, where you get a brown envelope on your desk. At the record. That, that's if private company still exists. You know, that's a whole other issue. Really. Now, yeah. the first thing you recorded was? Uh, well, uh, well, for Spoons, the first thing we recorded was My Job and After the Institution, which we recorded ourselves. We created our own record label called Mannequin Records. Mm -hmm. So we looked official to the whole media out there. <laughs> And uh, we use our, our, our own. Actually, I think we won a battle of all of the bands, uh, radio station, um, and got some money for that. And we recorded that. And that's what we took around to the record companies and to the radio stations. And uh, the universities and colleges picked it up right away. It was very strange, right? It was not radio friendly at all. But it was it was Dave Marsden of you know the mm -hmm. big radio name who. I think was one of the judges of that battle of the bands. And even then he, he said, I want to meet you guys. So we went down to his office and that's just to show you how lucky we were after the beginning or got noticed is that he said to us, you know, like you guys are doing something really cool here. I don't know what it is yet. And as we walked out the door, he says, I'm going to be seeing you guys again. And he was right. And he, he saw us all along our, our successes in, in the industry. And I think the main thing is being from Burlington and mm -hmm. sort of avoiding the Toronto scene. We're really different. You know, we try really hard not to sound like everybody else was coming out, you know. Mm -hmm. like, I think of some other 80s bands at the time from Toronto that, you know, they're trying to sound a little Duran Duran or a little this or a little that. We were just so off in our own planet that we didn't know what to sound like, you know. And that was a good thing, actually, being off on your own planet because yeah. it has lasted you for 40 years. Now, did you start touring right away? Were you playing your high school? Has the spoons or... <laughs> Oh, yeah, we played the high school. <laughs> our first high school experience was we played our own high school, and it turned in the audience turned it into a punk concert, not a new wave concert, and they were doing damage in uh, the cafeteria while we were performing. And then we got banned from Burlington for playing anywhere by the principal. Any, any high schools in like Southern Ontario for forever, you know? <laughs> Which is actually a good thing because got, it got us on the. On the uh, on the cover of the local punk magazine, <laughs> we were not right, but we looked kind of kind of edgy back then. The music, I mean, that first single was really it was punk, really. Mm -hmm. It was very. I just wanted more. I kind of yelled and and made weird sounds and squawks on my guitar, and it wasn't very musical. And I barked. <laughs> I barked. I yeah. barked. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but 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 then but then we got a record label quite quickly, and this is like I said. Without even sending demo tapes, though, we used to play a place called The Edge in Toronto. Legendary, you know, The, the Edge. Oh, yeah. Everybody was, yes. was played there, you know. Mm -hmm. like, big bands from all over first played The Edge. And um, the little record label called Ray Records came saw us there. We got signed. It wasn't even like we were looking for a deal. They just heard that we were different and weird and blah, blah, blah. And luckily, on that first record, it was produced by um, a young guy out of Fanshawe in London. Mm -hmm. um, what was his name? Paul. Graham yeah, Paul. Gra Graham Paul. And the, it was en engineered by Danny Lenoir. Danny Lenoir, yeah. of all people. And this, this is before he's really well known. Mm -hmm. working with YouTube. 
Brian, Brian Eno was in, in the studio sometimes, but and he just done uh, um, Martha and the Muffins. Right. So here we go. Right off the bat, we're, we're rubbing elbows with really influential, you know, movers and shakers. That And all along our careers, we were elected that way because people saw that difference in us. We weren't necessarily the best musicians, I don't think, mm -hmm. you know, but we were so different and quirky that, you know, Daniel Lau worked with, with us, John Punter, who'd done Roxy Music in Japan and stuff like that. And then um, Nile Rogers, you know, who'd done, you know, ended up doing, you know, David Bowie and, and Donna Summers and Madonna, blah, 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 and all these great people who wanted to, to, you know, I think because they liked it, they, they, they kind of <laughs> needed to fill that weird void that we were mm. giving them, you know, that, that not so normal thing that we, most bands were doing. Well, we got a couple questions here that are coming through. And if you want to ask the Spoons any questions, just uh, send them to us. Okay, uh, let's see here. Any plans to release Bridges Over Borders on <laughs> We hear that every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's our angst. <laughs> <laughs> but you have, do you have it on vinyl? You have it on vinyl, yes? We have it on vinyl. Um, we've been on and off again. It keeps changing hands as to who we get to talk to who actually uh, has the rights to the master. And, uh, Gord, you, you were the one that... Same publisher as Rush. We were on, on Anthem mm -hmm. SRO. Mm -hmm. And at one point, they sold all the publishing, including Rush and Spoons, uh -huh. to a publishing company. And we've been in talks with them for years. And they say, yeah, yeah, let's do something. And then nothing. Mm -hmm. And I call them back. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're working on it. Nothing. And of course, we actually had something firm with um, this year being our 40th. And of course, the pandemic hit and everything mm -hmm. shut down. And so, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not, not, it's the, the, don't say never because it is going to happen but hopefully before the 80th anniversary well we're looking for that we're looking for that spoons box set you know the combination of vinyl cd and singles that's like a big beautiful box it costs you about a hundred bucks of which there is only maybe i don't know maybe 500 to a thousand signed copies this is what you're looking for okay um, no I, I want i want a cassette tape box Oh, well, let's go one better. Let's go for the eight track box. You know, people are buying and making cassettes again. There's some young bands just will laugh about it. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to the dump because mm -hmm. we had Sandy had a basement full of old boxes. I had, and it was like the old, old spoons cassettes. And we thought they'd never matter again, right? Mm -hmm. And there's thing I remember going to the dump with a truckload of this stuff. And. <laughs> Without any remorse, just dumping them into the big bin, right? Uh -huh. Now I'm really sorry I did that because <laughs> yeah. I could have sold them, right? Yeah. Exactly. I remember this kid who was working there with a broom, and he's cleaning up, he's watching me, and he looks down into the things and what are those things? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's something your kid goes, you know, Dad, what, what's that? You know? Yeah. It, it made yeah. crack, son. <laughs> Where did yeah. it go? Now, <laughs> It's kind of like my daughter when I years ago, and I told her that you know we first started by putting out a forty-five. She goes, "Oh, what's a forty-five? Yeah, oh. yeah why, why don't you make it fifty? Like <laughs> round it off." Exactly. Yeah. So I guess your very first couple of singles are collector's items now. Yes, there was only ever a thousand uh, ever printed, and uh, we've only maybe got fifty left that I have in a safe place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one of those in my in my collection. Okay, a few more questions here. Uh, okay. What is your favorite song to perform live and why? Oh, wow. Well, we never get tired of Nova Heart, at least no. I don't. Mm -hmm. But I'm really enjoying the stuff off the new album. Yeah. And I wouldn't, I mean, you think every musician would say that, but there's some of the albums you put out, just, ah, yeah, whatever. This, the New Day, New World album, last one we put it, uh, I love like every song on it. Yeah, and, and slowly we're, we're doing a video for every, like every song on the album because mm -hmm. you know or the pandemic time and, and messages and all that sort of stuff. But um, so and songs off that album like first and last time I love to play mm -hmm. the title track New Day New World. It's so symphonic, you know. Yeah, it's um, it's so much stuff off that. It's so much fun to play. So that's really. What about you, Sandy? Uh, well, I enjoyed the new album as well. But then because Nova Heart has two forms, it's Nova Heart as as people remember it back in the 80s. And then we also have a kind of a heavy dance mix, dub mix of it that's a lot of fun to play live. Yeah. And it really gets the audience going and they start jumping and it's great that way. Cool. Yeah. More questions here. Uh, let's see. Uh, just someone wanted to say that, uh, where is it? 
Oh, that they remember seeing you guys at Ryerson in 1984 and <laughs> have been a fan since 1982 and love you guys. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, what else here? We've got, there's been talk of uh, musicians and bands playing at drive-ins. Any plans for the Spoons to be playing at a drive-in? Yes. Here, here, yes. Here, yes. Three days we, were, we were saving that for this next uh, little talk. We're going to have a one through. Okay, yeah. so we'll, yeah. we'll, yeah. we'll uh, the one answer one. is yes. 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 We actually had this idea, let me just say, over a month ago. Now, obviously, it's been done since then in um, Europe and, and the States. Mm -hmm. And somebody announced the show before us, because I thought we'd be the first in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and we still may be. So I will talk about that. Um, but doing a drive-in tour, you could play all little, small. you could play really small towns because most of the drive-ins aren't in the cities. They're always just on the outskirts of the cities. So you could play small towns like, you know, the Spoons live in Burnaby. You know, yeah. <laughs> they have a drive-in or something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like a lot of fun. Um, I assume that you guys will resume your tour with a flock of seagulls. Who yeah, knows? well, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I've missed a lot of work with them myself. We were supposed mm -hmm. to do the Los 80s tour again this year, like mm -hmm. you know, the, the Greek theater and Vegas and all that stuff, and a couple of cruises, which wouldn't have been a good idea to be on. <laughs> but as well, we, we had a package with, it was Spoons, Memorial Hats, and Hats, Flock of Seagulls, right? That we did a month of right until things were shut down. We just got snuck in. California and Western Canada casinos, mm -hmm. and we had more booked. We also did Casino Rama, and they're all sold out shows. It was, it's a great package, and it's, it was booked for um, Casino Windsor, and then out east and stuff. So hopefully that will resume when when uh, things open up. Yeah, we've also decided because this is kind of like a year that's not actually happening for music that we'll continue our 40th next year once we can continue on and move reached out to Rob and Derek that they'll join up with us still. So sure. people can still hold on to that. <laughs> okay. Rob, you know, Rob is in, Rob uh, proves the original gear play lives in New York. Mm -hmm. So he's been, he's been really holed up more than we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, someone also wants to know, is Gord still playing uh, guitar for both bands? I think we answered that question. Yes. yes. Uh, how have you both stayed together all these years? What are the key ingredients to such a long-lasting uh, relationship in a band? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, other than for, for me, I mean, we started off as, as friends in high school, and then eventually we formed into a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. And then when the band got too big, um, we found like we weren't as individuals anymore. It was like Sandy Gord of the Spoons, Sandy Gord of the Spoons. We didn't have separate lives. Right. And uh, we decided, well, maybe we should have separate lives and just have the band. So it's like we're married to the band. <laughs> <laughs> but, so if, you, if you can get through that, you can survive anything. And you know what it is? When we saw the, the love people have for 80s music, once it came back, like when, when it ended for a while there at the beginning of the 90s, I kind of thought that was it. But when we saw how much people wanted it back and mm -hmm. the appreciation, you can't help but get excited and, and and just never get tired of it. I mean, it's such a joy to do this. It's not a job, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like a second life that we did not expect. You know? and I hope every band gets that. You must feel really good after 40 years when you look across the stage at one another and the music is just feeling right. Like you've got this new album and it seems like it's an album that was meant to be played live. And I see you guys on stage and you look across and there, there must be such a comfort and a joy there that you can rely on that person and you've been relying on that person and it goes beyond words. So just with a look or a gesture, you can just take it anywhere that you want to go. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. That's what every band aspires to, right? It mm -hmm. doesn't take 40 years to get that. It might take a year or two or three or something where you don't have to even say anything. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's the wrong thing. I used to, people in the band used to say, oh, you gave me that look. What do you mean that look? I, to me, it was just a little sideways glance during a song because I didn't like where it was going or something. Mm -hmm. But you got this communication that you don't even realize you got, you know. Mm -hmm. And you're right, sometimes it's, it's kind of almost, um, it's, what do you call it? Uh, um, it's not psychic, but, no. you know. It's like, it's synchronicity. It's synchronicity. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's our, like it's something our, and it happens. Yeah, our, our music brain waves are all working together on the same channel, and we're just flowing through the song. Yeah, yeah. All right, a few more questions here. What do we got? Uh, how do we stay together? Uh, yeah, we answered the we answered that question. We won't even tell you what it was. Uh, what's your favorite venue in the world to play? 
Favorite video to play? Venue, venue, hall. Oh, venue, venue, venue. Ah. Uh, of course, well, they I mean, do that when you can't play. It used to, to me, for it used to be Ontario Place Forum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it was gone, I wish they would rebuild that. That was a wonderful place. Yeah. I mean, I mean, recently, I mean, any big outdoor festivals, I would think. So I would think, yeah. like, uh, with this, especially when it's nice, hot night and the, you know, with the flock, there's been obviously been some really cool ones like the Greek Theater and the Microsoft Theater in Los Angeles. There's the, the Mountain Winery and. Mm -hmm. In Saratoga, there's something in America has got some really nice. Mm -hmm. well, the cool thing about America is they've got like a whole bunch of forums, like Ontario Place, that kind of open, yeah. permanent thing. We only had the one. I mean, there might be a few more in Canada, but in the in the states, there's pretty well one in every city. So that vibe, I think, is is the best. You know, outdoors in the summer on a hot night, and pretty well anywhere. Yeah. You know, my my my, my driveway. <laughs> 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 What uh, what was the first record that you made that you heard on the radio? What was that like? Well, I think the first record we would have heard on the radio would have been uh, Stick Figure Neighborhood because CFMY was playing it. Mm -hmm. And that was really cool. But the most memorable, I think, was we'd recorded Nova Heart and it had just come out and it was climbing the charts and it was being played in college and university stations. And Gordon and I were driving along and we had our cassette of Nova Heart. <laughs> And we popped it in and we were listening to it. And then and the song finished and I ejected it out of the, the dash and Nova Heart was still playing. And we kind of looked at each other and went, well, well that's on the radio. <laughs> and then we checked other radio stations and it was also playing on another radio station at the exact same time. So that would, I think, be the most magical moment we had for radio. Yeah, yeah. What kept it going musically even when you weren't on the radio? How, how do you mean, mean like? I mean, like, to make, to I say it through the like in between in in between times in between records when you were thinking about the next record when it was time to do arias and symphonies you were coming out of a you know coming out of another yeah. period. So, uh, what kept you guys going musically? What did you want to strive and do musically that you hadn't done that inspired you because it kept getting more interesting, more interesting, more interesting. I mean, I always wanted to hear the orchestral version of arias and symphonies, you know? So that, and that was a major work, especially in Montreal. People just loved that record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that, that's funny you mentioned that. We even talked about at one point making a musical out of it because there's a real story in that thing. It's like, uh, arias and symphonies is kind of like our brick in the wall. You look at it lyrically about, you know how little boys and little girls have to be growing up in school with their parents and pitch and hold and trying to break free and be their own person and stuff. So that that, that was an idea. And we've done we've done Nova Heart with an orchestra, but actually um, Jeff Carter who, who produced like the the remix of a Nova Heart, uh -huh. he's working on a similar thing for our symphonies, which has an orchestral intro to it. Oh, it's very very uh -huh. cool. Yeah, cool. It's funny you should mention that. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, I, I didn't know there was a story behind Arias and Symphonies. Yeah, it's, it, Arias and Symphonies is not about Arias and Symphonies. Like, an aria is like a moment in a symphony or in an opera or something where the soloist will shine, stand out, and just, oh, this big thing. So it's kind of like the, the individual in the big picture, you know, kept standing out and breaking free from, from that. So that means you wouldn't expect that from a bunch of, you know, kids yeah. pretty well out of high school. It wasn't, it wasn't just a bunch of songs about partying and, and and girls and drinking and stuff. It was, you know, we, we had sort of these big thoughts and you know, a little full of ourselves, but it made it interesting, right? Yeah. And, and to the question about what we were doing in between albums, at the time when we first started from basically 80 right through just into the early 90s, we were constant. It was like uh, record, go out there, perform, tour, uh, get back to the studio and start writing some more. You know, it was just like a cycle around and around and around. It's very structured, yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's what bands will find you know, when they get into a label. But even if they're not, you know, that's a good thing for young bands to not just be sort of randomly meandering around, but build this, have a cycle of like writing, recording, mm -hmm. touring, video, you know, keep a sort of a, a cycle going. Right now, you know, we're not... A, we're an older band, so we we can take seven years between records. <laughs> you know, we have our fans all this new stuff. But as a young band, you know, you gotta have a cycle where people expect an album from you every 
every two years. And then they expect videos from you in between to keep them engaged and that sort of thing. So um, we didn't have that at the beginning, you know, but when you work with, when you get signed, you, you kind of get structure. And then now we're, we're lucky. We get to be totally unstructured and just create when we feel like it, or we've lived life a little bit, or we have things to say, like, you know, during this pandemic, it was a great opportunity to take songs that we already had and make so much more out of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I guess we should have talked about all that stuff a little bit later. We don't want to, we want to save that. For yeah. two. I think we're back on right one thirty. I should think have, so. Probably I need think some room so. here. I think Alan Cross is coming up pretty soon. I think so. Whose idea was it to work with Niall Rogers? Niall. It wasn't ours. It wasn't our idea. <laughs> it was Niall's idea, actually. It was Niall's <laughs> idea. Yeah. I was re I'm really happy that we did, but at the time, I it's not the kind of producer I thought was right for the spoon. I mean, Sandy, we were working with all these British, you know, John Hunter, those are the guy and the bands that he produced. You know, I wasn't coming from the American side of things. And not, until he worked with us, he was known for more like, like Chic and um, Donna Summers, that kind of thing. But he, when we did our album, the one just before it was Let's Dance by David Bowie. And that was a turning point in not only our careers, but his as well. He suddenly got into the mainstream bigger than ever. And then he had worked with Deborah Harry and, and uh, Mick Jagger and Duran Duran and all sorts of more some international pop bands rather than just the funk groove, you know, arm, you know, that version. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So how, how, you might want to tell the story of how we met them. Yeah. Well, we were on the Culture Club tour with the Aries and Symphonies album mm -hmm. opening for Culture Club. Uh, and we were at the Palladium in New York and Niall had originally come to see Culture Club and he came with Sting. And after we performed, he, they came backstage and we were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, I really like you guys. I want to produce you guys. And at that time, our our label in the states was A and M Records, and got in contact with them, and it just started from there. Yeah, that was not what we expected. We actually had Steve Lillywhite over. He's the guy I thought was cool for us. We've done U two and all the kind of XTC and really cool mm -hmm. British stuff, which I was I was thought we were more British than North American our sound. Yeah, but you know what? What now brought to the table, and it was probably the biggest thing that ever happened to us. You know, the stuff that we recorded with him and the doors he opened, and um, yeah, we're and we're still the only Canadian band that he's ever produced. Yeah, yeah. and did two records with him. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And did it did it change the way you looked at making records? Mm, not really. Yeah. I mean, maybe just uh, I think. It forced us to try to be a little bit more mainstream mm -hmm. because at that point we were pretty out there. I mean, Aries and Symphonies is more prog rock than pop. Right, really. right. And Stick Figure was more punk. And when we did the, um, the Talk Back album and um, Tell the Lies from My Traffic EP, actually it was funny because we, we did those songs with AM. Mm -hmm. And even those songs, even though, you know, to us they're pretty commercial, mm -hmm. I remember AM going, you know, like, or even like old emotions are going, oh, this is great. These songs are going to break you. So, you know, but they're still a little weird. You know, they're not really your average American. To me, they were like a huge step into being um, mainstream. Yeah. yeah. But to them, we were still like, oh, you guys are strange or something. Yeah. Like, we're not Frank Zappa. We're not, you know, we're not some out there thing. We're, but, you know, that, that was America back then. It's obviously changed a lot. Well, I think it's true. I think a lot of people thought you were a British band. In America, they weren't really sure about yeah. you know, and then you came to Quebec and you were gods. You were gods. <laughs> they... I miss Quebec. I want to go back to Quebec. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Actually, I played there last year with Flock Seagulls. With Flock Seagulls, mm -hmm. level forty-two and Corey Hart. Mm -hmm. At the end of the night, there were about ninety thousand people. Is there yeah. a great fest festival de Tate, whatever it's called? Oh, it was unbelievable. Yeah. And what a beautiful city! I forgot how beautiful Quebec City was. Mm -hmm. And that whole market is like. Why are we not there? Like yeah. it's, it's funny, even a band at our level, there's things that don't make any sense. And we haven't played in, in um, Quebec for how long do you think, Sandy? 30 years, maybe? 25 years? 20, <laughs> at least, yeah. About 20 years, yeah. I remember when you guys would come up and play the Spectrum, and it was just, uh, you couldn't get a ticket, and there wasn't, uh, there was no space anywhere. You know, and they just, they just absolutely loved it. Let's see, what have we got here? Oh, he says, Alan Cross is on at like 10 o'clock, so we've got some, we've got, I wish you give people a break. You know, go, go, have, go have a cup of coffee or whatever. And uh, a few, just a couple more questions here. Let's see. Uh, um, the did it, okay question about the '80s revival. Um, 
has it been good to you? Oh yeah. Yeah. I would say. I mean, we like we like to know that keep it out there that we're from the '80s, but they also we have not stopped since we started in the '80s, so we don't want to always just be labeled as that because we do have new stuff out that you know is more you know modernized, and we're not just playing our '80s music; we're playing our new stuff too. But but also to answer that question, we're we're lucky to you know that was a good decade to be part of musically because even though it came and went and now it's back again, is that um. We, it's it's kind of timeless. We got a lot a lot of young bands have those '80s flavors, right? Mm -hmm. They have mm -hmm. those guitar tones. They got the choruses back and echo and uh, drum machines and right. And, you know, it first appeared in dance music when they brought the 808 drum machine, kind of just popular again. And now that all those sounds, I get stuff all the time. People send me of brand new young bands going, "Oh, this sounds just like you when you guys were starting out." But this these guys are stealing your sounds. And no. So it's kind of cool. We can do what we do because we're not stuck in the 80s, but we're always going to have that flavor. We could be this, if somebody's never heard of us, they could hear one of our new songs go, wow, these guys are cool. They got to got that 80s sound a little bit, you know? <laughs> so it's a good, it's a good decade to be part of, you know? Yeah. Uh, they want to know what you're listening to in your spare time, both of you. Um, I mean, I, listen, I like I have new stuff. I always download new stuff, you know, like, um, but you know what? I, I decided a couple of days ago, my favorite band in the world of all time, and I'll probably never see them live, and they're not a classic, but it's The Verve. Oh, okay. There is something about them, and oh my God, and I, they're probably the band I've learned the most from, too, through the, through the years, about building songs. They're, they're masters of stripping things down, and we do that with some of the Spoon songs now, too. Mm -hmm. that we take the songs that are classic, it's almost take them right down and you build them and stress the ending like the end of no harder mm -hmm. and just really work sort of hypnotic patterns you know and ashcroft and his gang are just masters of that and um, um, that's really lately i just that's all i've been listening to in the car just be inspired mm -hmm. i know sandy you have some different influences right back to judy garland yeah right? that, that's why i even got into the stage and music was when i was a little girl i was um you know all about judy and wanting to watch her movies and with her little series she had going with Mickey Rooney and mm. of course, and, and and I said to myself when I was like four years of age, that's what I want to do. I didn't know how I was going to get to stage. I just knew I was going to get there. Um, but as far as music goes, I mean, I've always listened to a wide variety of music um, from, you know, classical to um, industrial. I was part of an industrial band at one point when spoons weren't as busy called industrial arts. So I like to get my paws into Every style of music. Like, I mean, Sandy's recorded something which was like a, he did a couple, like a month ago. It was just you and it was a very sort of Euro. Oh, yeah. Um, kind of a romantic. jazzy um, yeah, thing. Yeah, I thought, wow, that, that's a whole other, that really suited your voice. I think you could do a whole thing, even taking all Spoon Song and doing that style, sort of like, you know, um, Girl from Ipanema. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> Jazz. Uh, spoons, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah <sure. laughs> uh, a few more questions here. Let's see. Um, ever think of doing some tunes acoustically alone tonight would be perfect for that? They're saying. Yeah, I, I've done I've done alone tonight acoustically. Yeah. I mean, I've I've done a few shows on my own. Like when I used to go, I mean, I used to go to PI with with Megan every every summer, and I do a show at a place called the um, Trailside. Okay. Yes. Everybody goes through there and does acoustic shows. And I, I mean, I've done some shows here, but I never get to do much. But there, I've got to do like two sets, right? And I, I've done that one acoustically. And you're right, it's a really. And if you look at, listen to the beginning of that, mm -hmm. just to prove that we do come from progressive rock roots. Mm -hmm. da, 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 those choruses, so that F over um, to G with an F bass, and so that really Genesis type of chord change. You know, that's, that's where that came from, even though it's in the middle of a pop song from the 80s. Yeah. Let's see here. Time left. Okay. Just do a couple more questions because they're coming through here. Uh, what do we got? Oh, wait. Oh, wow. I didn't even go all the way up here. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Drive-ins. Yeah. Both bands. Yeah, we got that. No, they're not married. Uh <laughs> We are married, but not to each other. Yes, married to married to music, married to music. Uh, I wish you'd mention that we're both, uh, you know, we both have people in our families close to us who are these sort of frontline workers, and that's another reason why we did the videos and 
we worry about them every day. You know, Sandy's daughter is a nurse. Yeah. And my wife is a, Megan is a pharmacist. It goes to work every day. Mm -hmm. And the director of the video, Peter Sacco, his partner, she works at a long term care place, you know, so we're well aware of what's going on and feeling it. And, yeah. Um, they want to know what sort of, so the 40th anniversary, which wasn't able to happen this year because of unforeseen circumstances and acts of God or not, um, next year, what are you going to do for, are you going to do all the things you want to do this year, next year, or are you replanning that now? Uh, pretty much, uh, quite a bit of it. Uh, some of the festivals and so forth said we're just postponing till next year. Okay. So it's not like we, we've kind of lost the gigs for this year, but the shows will be on next year in the same, possibly the same venues. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Like we had a big show at the Sound Music Festival in Burlington, which is going to have the original band. We're going to be at the um, band shell of the CNE at the end of the summer. You know, and like couple, and we had shows out west, which we haven't been up. We're finally doing festivals out west. Mm -hmm. you know? The big one in Kelowna, the big one in um, Vancouver, yeah, and saying and at Vancouver and Saskatoon, like these big the rock the river and rock the rock whatever rock the pond. Or whatever <laughs> it is. Like, there's a, lots of those out there, and this was the year for those things that we come back and um, you know just a little blip we got to get through. The, music is great, but it's not the most important thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So let's just get through this alive, and and then then we'll get back on track. But once it is back on track, I think music is one of those things that people will really crave, especially live performance. Yeah. Uh, someone's asking any books, any more books coming? Uh, that's, 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 that would be that's my, my job. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do the, the counterpart to Gord eventually when I get around to it. So. Oh. Yeah, you have a picture of you looking at my picture going, yeah, really? Yeah. That's not how I remember that. <laughs> yeah. uh, someone commented, uh, your sound was ahead of its time. You were a 2000s band in the 80s, they say. Ah, so nice. That's, that's, thank you. I didn't think so, because maybe because we were just so weird. Yeah. <laughs> now, we've got another session coming up uh, in a while where we're going to talk about, uh, you know, how to make music and what to just sort of do during. Yeah, we've done some really cool things. That, yeah. I mean, the uh, driving thing is only one thing, but there's some other really interesting things that we've been doing and Sandy's been doing that are, have never been done before, you know, and some things that we have planned and um, maybe we'll talk about that, maybe get, you know, put some ideas in some young band's heads for what they can do right now. Yeah. And is it is it time to, you know, like you always, both of you always do a certain amount of mentoring to young bands or young talent and helping them along. That's, uh, that's always quite an interesting process. Try, yeah. As you see young ones coming up, uh, like Gord, your son is writing with you, and Sandy, your daughter is singing with you. So that must be incredibly fulfilling. Oh, it is for yes. sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we know we know how to deal with people. It, it, it always starts off with, oh, no, I don't really need your help. <laughs> Dad, what about that? You know. You're yeah. Stuck. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, when you have children, you grow up. And they grew up with you they, they don't realize really what you've done or what you know what meets other people yeah. you know it's, it's to them it's just dad doing his job it's not it's, i might as well be selling shoes or <laughs> whatever it's that doesn't really phase them yeah so i believe our next session is at 1 30 so uh if everybody's asked their questions and if you haven't asked your question uh tune in at uh, 1 30 and we will yeah. take it up there um but uh, anything you guys want to say about this 40th anniversary? I mean, the new record is great. The videos are great. My favorite tune, as you know, is Landing Line, Landing Lights, and the video is great. And uh, the track is great, and you're playing uh, amazingly well. Uh, Thank you. I've been honored to be on the road with you as your opening DJ. I've been threatening to sing because I'm just going to join another band. Oh, <laughs> oh there you are. There you are. Oh, yeah. So, he, so when I say I'm threatening to sing, he goes out and then comes back. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. That's a comment on my talent. Oh, uh, trashed by the spoons. Thanks. Oh, we lost Gart's voice. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your, your voice is gone. We can't hear you. Did you turn your mic off by mistake? Uh, hang on a second. If I click, no, that's off. Oh, uh, off on. Well, that's okay. We were going to end the session anyway. 
And we'll be back at 1.30. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, everyone out there. Uh, Gord Sandy from The Spoons. My name is Michael Williams, as you see on that little crawl there. And we'll be back at 1.30 to talk about music during a uh, pandemic. Okay? Okay. Great. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay.